Um, just going to mention a couple of quick dates to everyone while they're here. Um, this Saturday night, uh, members barbecue up here. Um, and you've seen all the work in the kitchen and so on, so I think uh, we'll get to try the kitchen out. Um, we've got a school viewing night on Monday and Tuesday next week. I'm assuming everyone here can see all the messages in the uh, groups I.O. Is that correct, everyone? Mm -hmm. Can, so you know what's coming up. Um, Greg's also looking for more content for the Scorpius magazine. I think he wants to wrap that up uh, in the next week or something. So if you've got an article or something you've been working on, send it through to him. Um, what else we got? I'm unprepared for this, obviously. Mm -hmm. Society dinner's coming up in July. And that's the 50th. <coughs> it's going to be quite a big dinner. Um, I believe we're getting it catered. Is that right? We're going to cater for it. Yeah. So I think, I think what so. we're going to do is set up a booking, a booking thing, so, uh, a booking portal on our try booking. So we're going to put a cost to it, or just uh, maybe a couple of dollars, just so we know that people are coming. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, think? Yeah. Ideas, well, anyone? Less than five dollars All right. So if we were to charge five dollars a head. Yeah. All right, just to, just to put a book in, because I don't want people booking yeah. and not turning up and we've got a catered. Like the members only, Dave. The members only dinner, and maybe some invited guests of past members and so on. Sorry, Peter, I thought I'd just jump no, in. No, that's all right, you're doing a great job. Um, so what I'll do is I'll set that up in the next couple of days and send it out, so we'll do Saturday, that. It's a Saturday night. That's the normal barbecue night, which will be in July. The third, the third Saturday. The third Saturday, yeah. and we'll make it $5 a night, uh, 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 five dollars per person that's gonna eat, and that'll just help cover some of the catering. We'll get mm. that roast stuff again. That was pretty good at Christmas, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah. Organize that. Mm. Um, what else was there? <laughs> so this Saturday to uh, Greg, uh, sorry, Greg apologises for tonight too, so <coughs> no one's got a Sky for the month organised, so we'll just have to do it without tonight. Um, and he's also not available this Saturday. He's got <coughs> double booked already without a class, so Jamie is there. Are you going to do the barbecue Saturday? Because Saturday, yep. there's no peer or Greg. Yep. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so yeah, Society Dinner, that'll be a, a big night. We've got Vastrock 2 coming up, which is in August, pretty much August the 10th on the Saturday. Um, I am looking for members to book onto that shortly. Members haven't actually participated yet in it. So those not doing a talk um, <coughs> will need to book on. Um, it also includes the Astro Photography Workshop. So that's $100 <coughs> uh, per participant. And that includes two nights accommodation in the camp too. So you can bunk up here. Um, first in best rest. First in best rest. I think there's 50 or 60 beds, yeah? How many do you mean, bro? I don't know what that is. Okay, so that's a convention that's held every second year. Yeah. Um, oh, and we have basically talks <laughs> like tonight, I suppose. There's half a dozen on the back to back. Uh, we do some workshops, um, goes into the night um, in terms of viewing. What else we got going on? We've got some um, presenters coming up from uh, other societies. So it's a bit of a social gathering too of all amateurs. And we've got it's some... an opportunity for people to meet other amateurs that, that are not part of our school. Yeah, it's a social um, event. With but they come from all over the place. I'm at the Astro Photography well, Workshop to, too, which... They're supposed to. We ask we're going to come. That's right. So, actually, both of you two, yeah. I need to get a talk description off you. So I've just got your name there, but it's yeah. blank. Right, okay. So, just a half a paragraph of what we're going to talk just about. Just put down random... I think random. people are holding off booking until they see what your two talks are. Right, okay. <laughs> An abstract. abstract. Perfect. Um, so I need that. <clears throat> Now the weekend after that, we've got a Astro concert uh, up here. Now that's going to be uh, coming up from the Peninsula, I think it's Peninsula uh, Music, uh, an amateur uh, concert band. Um, and they're gonna play up here. They've got a, a grand as part of National Science Week. Um, so that is, uh, and we're still formalizing how it's gonna be going to work. It'll be a viewing night. There might be some trivia, some talks in between. Uh, a little bit dependent on the weather. Um, 
We're going to give you a charge to that night of ten dollars, which will be to the um, cover some raffle prizes. And is that right? How much to cover? What are we covering with that? No, that. Uh, we got raffle prizes separately, is that right? Raffle prizes separately. Separate, separate. And the ten dollars, which that's, that's for the event cost for the band. Um, that's it. So there's going to be a lot happening with with astronomy the next few months. Obviously, it's the fiftieth anniversary coming up. Um, there's a nice coin collection too, by the way. If you go onto the Australian Mint. Uh, the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. I bought some the other day of um, Chip and Villa. Um, actually, it was, Miller, it was um, um, Honeysuckle coin collection from the uh, 50th anniversary. And uh, speaking of radio comms, we've also, as I said, we've got a call sign VI3 Moon, which we've got allocated um, as part of the club, which is the first. So that's an amateur radio call sign. And that's going to be run for <coughs> the duration of the Apollo mission plus 50 years. So from, from to take off to touchdown, we have that call sign available. We'll be running it from the club here on the Saturday night, the night of the members dinner. So members can have a look and see what amateur radio is about. And a few other members are going to, um, to use the call sign over the week either side of that. Raffle, raffle prizes. <laughs> Please blanket. 3D puzzle. Bubble. I've sort of dug into the bottom of the raffle box. No, if you keep digging up port, that's first, fine. First stage kit. <laughs> Stand up at the stage kit. Uh, and a utility. A nine. small multi tool. Multi tool thing. Um, raffle box. Uh, tickets. We'll send around. Anyone want some? No, so dollar, dollar a ticket. Dollar a ticket, or you know, five for five dollars. Yeah. yeah. Um, Special price. <laughs> five five yeah. Oh, the other thing too is on uh, Thursday, the first weekend of August, we've got a public viewing night, and Greg scheduled a working bee there, which just before our bass truck and, and so on. So clean up, tidy up. Clean up, tidy up. I think most of the works have been done, and we can see the new kitchen. <coughs> Did you have anything else you want to talk about before we throw it over to Ross? No, I'll let the guest speaker go first. Uh, no, I've got a few um, what's ons. What do you got? Um, uh, uh, some of the things that are interesting at present. The um, uh, Sunspot Cycle is doing some interesting stuff at present. Mm -hmm. It's not cycling. And um, uh, the other one is on a mountain of ice, literally a cone of ice on Ceres. Yeah. Quite a big. I haven't seen anything about that. Oh, I'll, I've got some pictures of it. I do know now that NASA, now for the first time we're doing space tourism, you can now book through NASA to stay on the ISS. Mm -hmm. $35,000 a night, but you've got to book your own travel up and back via <laughs> SpaceX, <laughs> via SpaceX no, or Boeing. Buy an American. Uh, buy an American owned rocket company. You can't yeah, buy your ticket to. <laughs> The space station at thirty-five thousand a night for a minimum of twenty nights cycling. You can't, you can't buy a trip in the rivers. And you can't buy it. You can't, you can't have the Russians send you away. You have pain. Hmm? You have pain. No, no, it has to be the American no, rocket. It has to be American rockets. You get all up. Right. Right. <laughs> but um, you've also got to pass the uh, <coughs> the um, a standard fitness test for a uh, astronaut. They're not going to send and up. There's money up front, but if you fail the fitness right. test, you fall. That's non depot You, you get the oh, okay. back, which is Typically probably right. half. <laughs> <laughs> they look at him and go, "I'll put you on the treadmill. He'll be gone in a minute." Yeah, go <laughs> <laughs> Ross, do you want to uh, take yeah, it away? Yeah, no, 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 sorry, that was a question. No, not a question. Uh, tomorrow night. Yep. On three triple R between seven and eight. Yep. He's talk with Tony Stevenson. Um, um, oh God, they've got sacked from the museum. Great oh. book on the Melbourne Telescope. Anyway, to talk about the human computers for s the women for some time, a session <coughs> sometime between seven and eight tomorrow night. Three triple R. Three triple R. Yep. Seven and eight. Beautiful. Anything else? Yeah. There's a lot coming up, guys. So. Absolutely. That's about that movie. Busy time's coming. Busy time. And the media's going to be pretty big too now with uh, a lot happening with this 50th anniversary and 
every society, everyone's coming out from every rock <laughs> doing um, and doing something for this 50th anniversary. I've been getting heaps of emails from people um, saying, um, we've organised the talk, but you promised us, and I've got yeah. no record of them ever contacting me. Oh, I, I went to I went to the space show, show too last Saturday night down at Federation Square. Um, I wrote an article for the magazine already describing the event, so you'll have to make sure you get the uh, the next uh, Scorpius magazine from Greg and read how good it really was. All right. This talk bar was, was asked to do uh, for the ASV uh, diurnal section and it was in aid of the uh, 150th anniversary of Albert Einstein's death and the number of us presented and I was asked to talk about his work and it's interesting, um, you know, you sort of think you know all about Einstein, you've been looking at him for years and that. I found a few interesting things and one of the interesting things is that um, as I'm director of the, the cosmology section of the ASV and I get a lot of people who come up and uh, uh, present things and they, they, they think they've just solved all the, all the physics problems known to man uh, in a single paper that they've written and the, the, big, the, the big justification is all, Einstein did everything as an amateur didn't he? And it's interesting we'll see exactly, that, that, is, that is definitely, a, um, definitely not correct. Um, uh, we'll start off Einstein the scientist. Um, just a couple of quotes from me. He's got uh, there's whole books of quotes on Einstein, but there's a couple I like. Life is like riding a bicycle. To keep your balance, you must keep moving. God doesn't play dice with the universe. <coughs> And this is my all time favourite. The cluttered disc is a sign of a cluttered mind. Of, of what then is an empty disc a sign? Okay, so we're going to talk about the early years, his uh, marvellous year, his way to work, and his legacy. So we'll start off. He was born in Ulm in the Kingdom of Württemberg in the German, German Empire in, on the 4th of March 1879, which my calculations are years ago. Um, one of the things I like about Einstein is he, he was born in Württemberg, as with my, quite a few of my relatives. So, um, he had a father and, father and mother. Um, his father was an engineer. Um, and he went into business with his uncle and founded uh, electric, electrical manufacturing business. This, these two words here basically mean. Uh, okay, these two words here basically mean electrotechnical elect, 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 manufacturing. Um, a company making electric equipment based on direct current. And this is interesting because he 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 later on. Um, spends a lot of his time working with um, electrical equipment and and and, and um, dynamic type things in, in his later work. So it's probably um, as a child he uh, he got involved with his father. So this is him at the age of 16, and he, he didn't necessarily get on with all his teachers. And in fact, his teacher when he's 16 told him, you will never amount to anything. And it's quite an extraordinary um, thing to say to a, a young, young child, I guess. But um, I think one of the reasons that the teacher was moved to do that was that he, he didn't appear to pay attention in class. Um, he, uh, his mind was off trying to do all sorts of other things that were more, were more interesting what the teacher had to say. Uh, but as we see, he did actually do extremely well school. Uh, this is a couple of years later, but you can see there that six out of six was a, was a perfect mark and he's achieved that in, uh, in uh, was it five subjects and he's passed in everything. So, so he may not have necessarily been uh, 
giving his teacher 100% concentration, but he was he was certainly uh, certainly understanding what they were teaching him. <coughs> um, he then went on to uh, the next the next level, uh, a d diploma program with the Zurich Polytechnic. And those a few of these very long and difficult to pronounce German words, so we won't try try and embarrass ourselves too much. And here he meets his first wife. Uh, Malayva Marek, uh, who was also studying there, and the past exams in, in maths and physics, and was awarded a federal polytechnic te teaching diploma. So he's, 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 he's completed his, his classwork. <coughs> After graduating, he spent two frustrating years <coughs> searching for a teaching post, um, and I've since writing this, I've, I've that someone say that what, what the problem was was that he, he was very interested in what they call fundamental physics, so in other words, looking at the, the big picture and not necessarily the easy to solve problems. And a lot of his, a lot of his lec lecturers weren't, weren't keen to give him a reference <coughs> uh, because they saw him as being uh, um, as probably um, un unlikely to um, come up with an answer. When you get into some of this um, fundamental stuff you, you can take many many years before you can get anywhere and you may not you may not even solve the problem so so they sort of favored <coughs> ones who have showed an interest in in what were the popular topics of the day it took him two years but he got a job in the in the uh, um, patent office uh, probably most of you know um, which is not particularly um, um, appropriate for the qualifications he had, but that, that paid his bills. <coughs> and um, he, 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 in the following year, his position was made permanent, um, but uh, he still had things he had to do. He, he had to still, still master machine technology before they would uh, promote him. And he remained there till 1909. Much of his work at the patent office related to questions about transmission of electrical signals and electrical mecha electromechanical synchronisation of time. Um, this, of course, is um, where he got lots of his ideas uh, for later, later work. Um, and again, it probably relates from the fact that he, he probably had a little bit of interest back from when he, what his father was doing. Um, he published his first paper in 19... 19 Hundred, um, uh, and it was about capillary action. Um, so this is <coughs> he starts up a, a discussion group with with some of his peers, which he calls the Olympia Academy, and they meet regularly to discuss <coughs> science and philosophy. He starts this in 1902, so this is just after he started work, and he. he he um, includes the work of, of quite a few of the, uh, the noted sci scientific and philosophers of the day. Um, uh, he marries his wife, Marek, in uh, 1903, and the following year his son is born in, in Bern, Switzerland. Uh, he's moved to Bern, of course, with his job with the patent office. Um, Annus Mirabilis is Latin for miracle year. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a term that's been used for other people, but uh, uh, one of the classics is Nicholas Copernicus, who, uh, who of course um, realised that the, uh, the Earth wasn't at the centre of the, the universe. In fact, it, um, it revolved around the sun. Isaac Newton, who basically invented physics in one year. <laughs> uh, he uh, pretty much wrote the book on calculus, motion, optics, and gravitation, uh, based on a, a summary spent in isolation escaping the plague. Um, one person I would have thought would have me been mentioned for that would have been Galileo, with his, uh, all his discoveries with the telescope, but um, he doesn't apparently greater mention. Uh, but in 1905, uh, it was as Einstein's turn. Uh, he was living in the centre of Bern, and he's living in 
a house, which is this building here. This just this room, this but basically the rooms behind that, <coughs> those two windows there. Um, and the the papers that he wrote in 1905 were all all written in that apartment. And this is in the main street in Bern, and the main street in Bern is a beautiful, beautiful street. It's a uh, medieval, and it's, it's, it's the best best preserved medieval street in, in Europe. It's a photograph down the, down the street from not far from where, he's, um, uh, where Einstein's place is. It shows the, uh, one of the beautiful statues in the middle of the street. <coughs> and at the end of the street is what they call the Zeitglocke, which is uh, quite, a, quite a well known clock. And uh, I like to think of this clock as the it, this this was the clock that Einstein looked at when he when he um, when he when he changed our understanding of time. Um, so, on the 30th of April 1905, he completed his thesis at uni. So while he's working and thinking, he's studying there, and he, his dis dissertation was called a uh, new determination of molecular dimensions. I couldn't dig out what the German title was, but. Um, but then he, he then publishes four pa four papers in the Analytical Physics, which is uh, probably the Ger German equivalent of what Nature is today. So I've actually got quite a few of the papers. I've actually got a um, print of the front page. You can actually dig out the whole paper in both German and English in the, on the internet these days. And his first paper was on the photoelectric effect. And it was published on the uh, it was posted on the 18th of March and uh, published on the 9th, 9th of June. And the, basically this is, um, this is a landmark paper in the sense that it was the first to actually identify that um, uh, photons or, or energy itself um, were, were, were coming to street quanta. Um, Max Planck had done some experimental work prior to this, but, but Einstein actually then uh, took, took that and, and, and wrote, wrote a, theory, a theory behind that. Um, those who, who know, have you all heard of the photoelectric effect? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that was his first paper. Uh, his next one is on the motion of small particles suspended in a stationary liquid. So this is this is basically the um, Brownian motion. So he's looking at um, he's looking at um, microscopic like microscopic objects that he can see in a liquid, and he's seeing them being vibrated. And it's the same thing you see in air these days. You'll see dust particles dancing around in air, and he's he's concluding that, that that's caused by the by the motion of the air particle or the water particles that he can't see, and he relates that. And this is um, a landmark paper in, in what's, what's uh, st statistical mechanics, which is again um, very important later on. And his third paper, this was, published, this was sent in on the 30th of June, and it was published on the 26th of September. And this is his paper on special relativity. His title for it was on the elect electrodynamics of moving bodies, um, which doesn't really say that. <coughs> but what he does do is he reconciles Maxwell's equations for electricity and magnetism with the laws of mechanics introduced by, by Newton. And one of the big problems in, the, in that era was the fact that um, there was an experiment called the Michael and Morley experiment. And when you, with relatively normally, if, you, if you've got an object that's projected off a moving body, like you throw something off a train, the speed of the projectile is the sum of the speed of the train plus the speed of the body. But if you shine a light uh, off a moving body, you'll, you'll see, it, see it traveling at the speed of light regardless of, regardless of the speeds. And nobody could reconcile this. And, and, and as Maxwell equations had the light traveling at the speed of light, and, and, and Newton would suggest that <coughs> otherwise. And um, uh, he, he realised that that the assumption in all of that was time time was constant, he, or time was invariant, and he realised that he had to make time variable, 
And when he did that and dropped that into the equations, he, he was able to, to replicate the Michael Morley experiment theoretically, uh, which, it, which of course has been subsequently, like all his um, predictions have been subsequently proved. Uh, and that was a huge, a, a huge thing, but of course wasn't necessarily received uh, was received um, by the um, by the physics community immediately. Uh, very few people understood it when it was published. His fourth fourth paper uh, yeah. called "Does Does the Inertia Kind of a Body Depend on Its Energy?" Um, and it was in this paper that he 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 introduces uh, his his amongst other things he introduces his most famous equation e equals m c squared. It's not actually written in in the form that we uh, we recognise. He actually so, so he, talking about when a body gives off radiation, its mass diminishes by l over c squared. And here l is in fact what we now call e, and of course c squared is the speed of light. So from that we get mass equals p e over c squared. And transforming that became equals mc squared. <coughs> so these are the papers he published in 1905. We can see there six months from the 18th of March to the 27th of September. So, it, so he's, he basically submitted in six months four name breaking papers, which effectively sets out modern, modern physics. Um, and you can see there is published, each of them published fairly soon after being received. Um, so he continues to work at the patent office. Um, it doesn't get instant fame, and it's been recognised. But uh, in 1907, Einstein had what he would call his happiest thought. Um, he realised the principle. Princip principle of relativity could be extended to gravitational fields um, and he basically <coughs> wrote, wrote, used that and wrote, published a paper on that but essentially what he's saying is that, that the, um, he realised that uh, acceler ac acceleration due to an outside force like if you're in a lift or, or a car or something like that, um, you, if you, if you did, didn't see what was pushing you, you couldn't couldn't distinguish it from acceleration due to gravity. Um, yeah, so publishes um, publishes that paper there. And publishes another one the following year. And that, um, that article he argues that free fall is really an inertial motion, and for a free falling observer, the rules of special relativity apply. And this argument is called the equivalence principle. He also uh, predicts the phenomenon of gravitational time dilation. So, in other words, if you um, if you change change your, your gravitational field that you're in, um, then the um, then the speed at which a clock will run will change. And they, they run they run experiments like that by, put, by sending clocks up in jets and finding they're, they're running at different speeds. In 1908, he was appointed a lecturer at the University of Bern. In 1909, he's appointed associate professor in the newly created professorship of theoretical physics at the University of Zurich. In 1911, he's a full professor at Charles Ferdinand University in Prague. So, 1905, he's an unknown. Within six years, he's a full professor. Um, so, he, he wasn't exactly an amateur. <laughs> It was just unrecognised, basically. Um, in Prague, he writes 11 scientific works, five of them on radiation, mathematics, and quantum theory of solids. In June 2012, he returns back to Zurich, back to the ETH. Um, um, he's a professor of theoretical physics at ETH in 2012, and that's where he's originally studied. In 1911, he published another article expanding on his 1907 article. He thought about a case of a uniform accelerated box not in a gravitational field, 
and noted that it would be indistinguishable from Box City in an unchanging gravitational field. New special relativity to see that the rate of clocks at the top, top of the box accelerating upwards will be faster than the rate of clocks at the bottom. Uh, it includes the, clock, the rate of clocks depends on their position in the gravitational field. Oh yes, and this one here is, he estimates, he, he, he estimates how much light is deflected by massive bodies. But even 20 years after this, he, he still doesn't, doesn't think gravitational lensing, as this is called, um, is any use. And the reason is that when he does his, his calculations, he only uses stars. Um, of course, these days we use whole gravity, whole, um, galaxies, large galaxies filled with bl black dark matter um, to, to bend the light and we get, we get quite serious bending. Uh, but Einstein didn't rec never recognised that, that as a possibility to be used, but although he predicted it, he, he, he didn't have any faith in it. Um, In 1916, he predicted gravitational waves, ripples in the curvature of space-time which pro propagate as waves travelling outward from the source, transmitting energy as gravitational radiation. What does music sound like? The music sounds like 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 artificial music, like a machine. Oh, well, it's gravitational waves. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's vibrating, <coughs> vibrating space. Well, yeah. not really generating sound yeah. waves. And um, also in 1916, he publishes his, his <coughs> general theory of relativity. <coughs> in 1917, he applies the general theory of relativity to the structure of the universe as a whole. He discovered that the field equations predict that the universe is dynamic, either contracting or expanding. And uh, this worried, worried Einstein. At this stage, there's no evidence for the universe expanding. Um, and so he introduces a new term called the cosmological constant to the field equations in order to allow the theory to predict the static universe. <coughs> yeah, so this is Einstein's equation. Basically, the number, these, these numbers here are, are tenses and they're quite complicated and basically interlinked with each other. But you can see the two on the left. Uh, refer to the structure of space-time. The, um, the highlighted part there, lambda, is the cosmological constant, and then on, on the right represents the energy density of matter, of radi matter and radiation. So he, he stuck a, a number in there, and then he was able to get a, a universe he thought was, was stable. Um, in 1921, he, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for his services to theoretical physics and especially for his, his discovery of the law of the photoelectric effect. A um, the theory of general re relativity was considered uh, somewhat controversial, um, but also interesting enough, the citation um, does not treat his cited work as an explanation, but merely the discovery of the law. <laughs> uh, so there was still even the, even his um, photoelectric effect, there was still a little bit of nibbling around the edges on that one. Um, the idea of photons was considered outlandish and did not receive universal exception until 1924. Um, right. So uh, even though he's given the Nobel Prize, he's still he's still questioning his properties to <coughs> some of his greatest works. <coughs> Um, as quantum mechanics developed, Einstein became uh, disenchanted with it, um, and um, he, he's quoted as saying, "God doesn't play dice." But in fact, that wasn't his 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 greatest um, dislike of it. But um, 
in fact, he, he, he was one who, who uh, actually, um, he, he was one who initially proposed the fundamental <coughs> role of chance in explaining quantum processes. Um, but he, what he really objected to was the, the, what, he, what quantum mechanics implies about the nature of reality. And what's behind that, basically, is what Einstein thought was, in fact, that quantum mechanics wasn't the, the fundamental theory that, that, that controlled what was happening. What he believed was that quantum mechanics was a mask <coughs> that we looked at, at and there was, a, there was a, a classical reality behind that, and we could only see um, but we could only see the mask, and he wanted, he, he, one of his efforts was to try and get through that mask and actually try and see what was happening underneath. But as we, um, as other 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 theorists, of course, were pushing the, the the story that quantum mechanics was was the bottom, and, and, and that was what was really happening. Um, and that's what that's where Einstein sort of um, uh, deviated from 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 from, from quantum theorists. Um, he's quoted as saying, as far as the laws, laws of mathematics refer to reality, they are not certain. As far as they are certain, they do not refer to reality. Uh, it's pretty much uh, him saying he's not happy with it. <laughs> Whereas Bohr and his followers maintained that all we can know are the results of measurements and observations. Um, and this, of course, Bohr was uh, one of the leaders in developing what's known as the Copenhagen interpretation. There's Einstein and Bohr, and uh, they had a series of debates, uh, public debates, about quantum mechanics. Um, debates are remembered because of the importance to philosophy of science. The, the debates would be influenced later interpretations of quantum mechanics. So, so while uh, Einstein was perhaps not totally on board with quantum mechanics, he was still very keen to try and resolve, to resolve in the direction he saw it should go, and obviously very prepared to debate with Bohr on, on, on Bohr's ideas. And needless to say, they didn't always agree on everything they, they talked about. Um, following the discovery of the recession of Nebula by Edward Hubble in 1929, uh, quite famously, Einstein abandoned his static model of the universe. Um, and he changed everything all around. Um, in each of these models, Einstein discarded the cosmological constant, claiming it was, in any case, theoretically unsatisfactory. Um, some people quote, say that quoting is saying that, that um, it was his biggest blunder, but in fact, um, there is some evidence to suggest that, in fact, that he never actually said that. Um, that, that other people perhaps attributed the quote to him without him actually saying that. So here we go, this equation again, so we, we get rid of the get rid of that term there. And when that's if you make that zero, of course that whole term just disappears out. So it's still an equation, but it has no effect because it's zero. Not everyone was convinced about reality. In responding to a toast uh, science at the Royal Academy of the Arts in, in 1932, Sir Ernest Rutherford. Um, Theory of relativity by Einstein, quite apart from any question of its validity, cannot but be regarded as a magnificent work of art. So in other words, Einstein is basically saying, well, it's a very pretty theory, but does it, does it, does it, does it relate to reality? <laughs> um, that's the latest 32. In 1933, Einstein visits the USA and he realises he can't return to Germany after Hitler comes to power and he hands in his <coughs> German passport. He effectively becomes stateless uh, at that time. He uh, travels a few places and he goes to England apparently who, who are prepared to take him and by October 1933 he accepts a position at the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton, uh, a noted refugee for scientists fleeing Nazi Germany. So 1935, he publishes what's called the EPR paradox. And the, 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 the name of the thing is based on the initials of the authors. 
Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. And <coughs> what he's talking about here, um, he's conducting a thought. Ex they're conducting a thought experiment. He considers two particles which which interact, such that their prop properties were strongly correlated. Um, so according to Einstein, or according to EPR anyway, um, the two possibilities, either the two, post, two particles have these properties already determined, so you can imagine two, two electrons and they, they correlate or become what we call entangled, uh, and they separate and they get and move away from each other at close to the speed of light, they move away at a, at a speed such that they can't talk to each other. If you measure the spin of one particle, then you, then you must know the spin of the other particle is, is what, 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 we, what they're finding in experiments. Um, so Einstein, <coughs> Einstein's idea was the particles already had these properties determined and we're only, we're only just, um, we're just measuring them. Whereas the other alternative was the process of measurement of the first particle instantaneously affects the reality of the position and momentum of the second particle. Um, the, uh, the, the true answer we've come to discover, in fact, is number two. So this is a, it's a property called entanglement. Um, Einstein rejected the second possibility, and he, he's quoted there as calling it spooky action at a distance, <laughs> which pretty much sums it up, I guess. He, he also known in 35 with Nathan Rosen. He, he, uh, he worked together to produce a model of a wormhole um, which Einstein called, which they often called uh, Einstein Rosen Ridges. Um, yeah. yeah, so um, he, 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 yeah, he basically took um, black hole, two black holes and pasted them together. Uh, to make a bridge between them. Um, so that's uh, probably the first, first, first um, theory of work on wormholes. So here he is in, in Princeton. Uh, in 1940, on the eve of World War II, he endorsed a letter to President Franklin D. Roosevelt alerting him to the potential development <coughs> of extremely powerful bombs of a new type and recommended the US begin a similar research. This eventually led to the <coughs> Manhattan Project, which of course was the um, project where they developed the atomic bomb. Of course, I worried that the, um, the Germans were ahead of them, but in fact, they, uh, they covered late, the Germans weren't. But um, realizing how dangerous it was, particularly after selling them, he, he later campaigned against nuclear weapons. Einstein, 1947. Following research on general relativity, Einstein entered into a series of attempts to generalise his theory of gravitation to include electromagnetism as another act. So basically, um, general relativity and, and quantum mechanics are, are incompatible with each other. We know that um, uh, general relativity works with very, very fast moving objects, particularly um, or objects moving close to the speed of light. Uh, we know that. Um, of course, when, when the speed drops right back, you know, they just drop back basically to Newton's equations. Um, and quantum mechanics, of course, applies to very small objects. There are very few situations where both, uh, both are needed to explain a phenomenon. And one of the classics here, of course, are black holes, <coughs> where you need both to look at. But um, even today, this hasn't, Einstein was never able to, uh, well, he had not only could describe the unified field theory. Um, um, while he continued to be lauded for his work, he, 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 he was never successful. And of course, the big problem was that he was only looking at electromagnetism, and of course there's two other forces that weren't discovered till after his death, which is the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force. They have since been rationalised with electromagnetism, but um, today um, uh, gravity still remains separate from the, the other three forces. Uh, in 1955, he experienced internal bleeding caused by a rupture with the abdominal, uh, uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm. Uh, 
um, Einstein refused surgery, saying, I want to go when I want. Um, it's tasteless to prolong life artificially. I've done my share. It's time to go. I'll do it elegantly. And he died in hospital the next morning, 76, having continued to work until the end. Apparently, in hospital, he was working on a, working on a speech as planned to give in a couple of days. published more than five, three, sorry, 300 scientific works and more than 150 non-scientific works. Um, chemical, element nine, uh, chemical Element 99, Einsteinium, was named for him in August 1955, <coughs> four months after his death. In 2000, 2001, Einsteinium is an inner main gold asteroid discovered on the 5th of March 1973. Uh, this is a photograph of Einstein's desk taken mere hours after he died. So, so he did believe in having a messy desk. Einstein's legacy. <coughs> he discovered black, black holes, or, 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 or I should say he um, wrote the theory of discovered black holes. Discovered gravitational lensing, now, used, now quite, used quite often in um, in astronomy, gravitational waves, and we've, we've now detected something like eight uh, mergers of black holes and neutron stars with these gravitational waves. There's probably more by now. We, I think they've stopped publishing. Publishing gravitational waves. Yep. 2007 was the first and that confirmed Einstein's 100-year-old prediction. So, yep. <coughs> Basically, um, you, you, whichever direction you shine the light, you still observe it going at the speed of light, so it doesn't matter whether the source is moving towards yeah. you or away from you. It will effectively try to determine whether there was a Yeah, and so the speed remains, remains constant. You get you get, the, you get the Doppler effect where, it, where the frequency changes, but, you, but the speed, the speed um, whereas, whereas classical physics predicted that, that the, the two speeds should add, to, add together. Yeah, yeah during, during Einstein's career, yeah, a lot of these other people, like in the 1600s, they discovered uh, other planets and that. Did he? Einstein, when he was around, did he ever find out uh, a part of the universe that nobody else known, or what? No, no, he 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 was pure, he worked purely with mathematical and physical theory. Um, he did when when he when he published the theory of relativity, he did predict twenty one experiments. Something like that, anyway. Um, he did something like twenty experiments. Um, and, but he never, never, from my, my knowledge, he never actually performed the experiment himself. But the experiments that he proposed with his theory of relativity were all, <coughs> all eventually performed over the next 20 years, and, and the answers that he predicted uh, were, 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 were all found to be correct. So basically, he imagined, imagined the world in his mind, and he could even work, even work out, work out, the, work out the um, experiments to prove it. But he, but he never actually did that himself. Yeah. Um, is there any knowledge of how Einstein arrived at the equation of the limits of script? Any experimental evidence, or was it purely mathematical? Um, I believe it dropped out of. Yeah, I'm not sure. But I believe it was dropped out of um, uh, experimental, experimental, also theoretical um, argument and, and mathematical um, calculation. I can maybe be able to help. Yep. They have put uh, particle beams through a deflection mechanism and they found that uh, as the speed increased, uh, it showed up that these particles were heavier. Yeah. So uh, the, the energy added to those particles increased their mass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, certainly, certainly everything is proposed in terms of relativity has been, has been um, 
been uh, confirmed by experiment, but of course he never, never, never did. Um, it's interesting as well that, that, that some of his equations actually um, that, he, that he derived uh, had been derived by other people as well. And one of the, main, one of the obvious ones I know of is what's called Lorenz contraction. And this is where, where you, um, something traveling at the speed of light, you see it to be foreshortened. Lorenz had derived that as, an, as, a, as a way of getting around the Michael Morland experiment, but it only answered the, the problem with the Michael Morland experiment, but it didn't, it didn't solve any other problems and it created other issues that were wrong. Um, but Einstein, with his maths, and I've seen a derivation to actually come up with these equations of special relativity. They're quite simple if you, if you studied in the right direction, apparently. But, um, but, but that, that one equation dropped out of his, his analysis, um, even though Lorenz had published it sort of a couple, couple of years before. So, so it sort of, he, he, he gets his name on it sort of thing, but, 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 but even though Lorenz didn't really solve anything, whereas Einstein had actually solved the problem. You know. um, so quite a few of the things he found were given names to other, given the names to other people, in recognition of some of the work that, that they were attempting to do as well. Yeah, the thing is going back to that question, the, like other people have, have, uh, have contributed and have made inventions, and this is the uh, you know change. Did, did he actually uh, in his time? Did he have bring? I know he's a brilliant scientist, no doubt about it. Did he actually bring any new dimensions in to alter the course of certain things, or just was he just a good scientist? Or, did he invent anything given up in um, the Apparently he did actually invent a uh, refrigerator. <coughs> Sorry? He did invent, did invent a refrigerator apparently. He tried to go into business with it. Yeah. But it didn't work. Oh, it worked, but it didn't work very efficiently. Well, uh, well, well, well it's, yeah, I guess it's one thing to, to develop a refrigerator. I guess the other question is be able to sell it at a, at a, yeah. sell it at a price that many people want to pay, isn't yeah, it? That's fine. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I'm not sure whether he did too many, had too many practical um, uh, developments, but yeah, he put his mind to a lot of different things. Um, do, do we know what what started the process or stimulated him to, in that year that he released those four papers, what suddenly brought um, Russia well, he, he to Well, he had his he had his discussion group, and he, he, he even bef I guess even before he started his discussion group, he was probably grappling with some of these problems. Um, one of the other interesting anecdotes that, that I, I came across years ago, and I can't remember who, who it was, but I'm sure it's probably one of these people in this discussion group. Um, seven weeks before he published his special relativity paper, he, 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 was, he was at loggerheads. He was saying, OK, on one hand, Maxwell is, is right. You know, he's, they've done all this proof of Maxwell. On the other hand, is Newton. And <coughs> 300 years, and that's all proved, blah, blah, blah. But you know, when you put them together, you can run this Michael Morley experiment that all falls out. You know, there must, there must be an answer to this. And he's talking, he's talking to this other guy. He's obviously a scientist. I, 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 I've been told the name, but I can't remember. And um, he just sort of turned to him and said, um, "What you got to do is check, check your assumptions." Seven weeks later, he published. And assumption was that time was invariant. <laughs> that was that was wrong. <laughs> And he was, you know, so so he was. He'd been, been mulling. He'd probably been mulling over that for, for 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 months, a year, even a couple of years. You know, he got these two things, and they were, they were at loggerheads because Michael's Morley experiment was, I think, probably eighteen ninety something. Eighteen eighty in the eighteen eighty eighteen eighty seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it had been around for, for twenty years, and nobody had sort of, or people had had a go at trying to solve it, and nobody had sort of got anywhere with it. So. Um, and uh, yeah, he, he, he'd obviously caught more of this and said, oh, I'll have a go at this. <laughs> um, yeah, but um, I guess it's his, his, his um, the other thing was, of course, is that it, we're, apparently we're working in the um, patent office, apparently he completed all his work in about two or three hours a day, spent the other, the other, other how many other hours he was there just um, doing, doing his mathematical stuff. Mm -hmm. So. Um, uh, he, of, he was getting paid to paid to think <laughs> about other things as well, um, and it wasn't that they didn't give him a lot of work. I, 
I gather that meant that he was sort of three times faster than, than all the other guys. <laughs> yeah. I think there was also a case where at the round about that time they were some scientists went out to observe Mercury crossing the sun and they were out by five minutes or mm. like thirty seconds and sign Einstein was able to yeah, change the um, calculation and stuff. There had been there had been some observations of that and they realised that Mercury processes, in fact all the plants process a little bit, but Mercury has the most being so close. And now you know about having to explain it to Newton about the this precession. And Einstein had had included in his, his theory what this should be. And when when the next um, transit of Mercury happened, um, they were able to, um, to no, I think that's 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 the gravitational light Ben Lindsay made that proof of it with the um, you are on the right track, but I didn't realise it was something to do with precession. With Newton's equations, he can't calculate accurately the, uh, the orbit of Mercury. Yeah. Until you yeah. take into account. Yeah, well, Einstein certainly equation. corrected that with his, yeah. his, his theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I'm getting confused, sorry. Um, yeah, the other thing was that when they, um, <coughs> when they had a. Um, it must have been a. It was a solar eclipse. In the solar, that's right, solar, that's right. So I'm getting, getting to the solar eclipse, they, they proved the bending of light, yeah. It's a photograph yeah. taken near Brew. Mm. Yeah. And that repeated in the So he, he, he was he's remarkable in what he was able to remarkable in what he was able to do it really was. Yeah. One, one of the things there that he uh, until he came up with the equivalence pr principle, um, he, which he didn't really understand until he went and published the paper on it. <laughs> um, is that the energy density in space has mass. So the gravitational field of the sun, close into the sun, has mass. It turns out it has mass of uh, a small planet. And so Mercury was being affected by the gravitational uh, effect of that mass. Even though there was no matter there, the gravitational effect was there. So it was it was that gravitational energy that was causing the precession, and we do that all the time. One of, one of the um, um, things I like about modern physics and science generally is that mostly it's it's almost religious. There are fundamental beliefs that are taken as <coughs> true. You can't possibly change them, and so you have things like. The planets are in circular orbits on glass spheres, and, and you think, well, why the hell would they think that? It's because that was locked in as a religious truth. So anything you came up with, yeah. it couldn't you couldn't change that truth. Yeah. And um, Einstein was sort of knocking on the door of another fundamental in physics, in classical physics, which says that uh, energy is conserved and um, that. Nowadays, we'd say the universe has a total amount of energy and that doesn't change. It was created when the universe formed and the total energy of the universe, while it's, things are happening, the total energy of the universe is not changing. Uh, and what Einstein was able to show was that, uh, yes, that's right, the universe was changing, but it was changing in its, um, uh, in its form. So there's... There's energy and speed, there's energy and gravity, and, and there's equivalent mass. Um, and yeah, the, yeah, yeah, before that, everyone believes that, that, that energy was energy was um, different. Energy was conserved and, and mass was conserved. Well, basically, it showed that you can change energy from mass and back again. Precisely. Yeah. yeah. And um, uh, the, the speed of light is fixed. Uh, I mean, it, in relativity, he actually said it's invariant. It's, that's it. Yeah. And he asked the question, why is it invariant? And it's it, it's um, invariant because if you ask a different question, what is the rate at which an electric field can be created or collapse? Now, remember that Maxwell's equations shows us that a changing electric field will create a magnetic field. And what you've got is a a little packet of energy, or big packet of energy, depending on how big, and it's in in the form of, of 
magnetic energy or it's in the form of electric energy but it's not fit it's it's not not uh, fixed in time it's changing the electric field is uh, <coughs> at some point in time is increasing very fast and so the mass of the total thing is also increasing but in order to maintain the mass the magnetic field is dropping mm -hmm. so a, a photon of light which is a uh, is, there's no matter there what there is is energy that is constantly changing between magnet, uh, uh, magnetic energy and electric energy and if you ask the question how fast can you convert from electrical energy to, to magnetic energy which Maxwell's equations will give you that it shows you that they will convert at a particular rate and that the the uh, electromagnetic structure will move at a particular speed and that speed is the speed of light and so it's fixed it's fixed by the energy of the of the or, or rather the mass of the uh, electromagnetic um, photon sounds weird but it's <laughs> and and, and, and uh, today we're locked into another type of what I think is a religious belief I mean if you go back to the days when planets moved on crystalline spheres you come up against the uh, people that re religiously believed that that was the way it was and uh, good old Galileo was knocking on the door there saying no I'm not really sure about that um, and Einstein was doing the same thing with the religious beliefs in Newtonian physics I'm sure there's somebody out there that's knocking on the door to our <laughs> Our uh, scientists saying exactly the same thing. I I mentioned that to um, <coughs> to the speaker last month, um, and I suggested that the dark matter problem could be solved with a modified steady steady state theory, and I was amazed at the reaction I got. It, it was a religious reaction. Oh, steady state theory can't possibly be right. Um, and I thought, geez, I'm really hitting some <laughs> some nerves there. <laughs> I've, I've come to the conclusion with the big the Big Bang. I think there's as many many theories on the Big Bang as there are theorists theories theorists working in the field. They've each got their own little nu nu nuisance on, on it, you know. Yeah. And but there are um, there are those who, who insist that an inflation must have happened and blah 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 happened like this blah blah blah. And there are there are others who are equally adamant. Um, that, that inflation never occurred and you can explain it by other means. And a couple of key, key ones that, that are involved in, in working out inflation of swapped sides. <laughs> it's it's all good. based on, uh, and I use the word religious, um, mm -hmm. a bit tongue in cheek, but uh, or, or once, once, once they have their theory, um, they, don't, they, 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 they don't want to admit they're wrong. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> I think they, they generally go to the graves believing they're absolutely right. I had uh, the opportunity when I was much, much younger to um, talk with um, uh, Herman Bondi, who was one of the guys that was part of the steady state theory. Um, group of physicists <coughs> and uh, and uh, I can't remember who the other guy was. Um Bondi, uh, that was um, Hoyle. Hoyle? No, no, Hoyle was Hoyle. Hoyle came up I think with the name of Big Bang, very disparaging. Yeah, he didn't like it. Um Yeah, or, or Hoyle Hoyle was one of the great advocates of the steady state theory. Bondi and there was another guy, yeah. Hoyle, Bondi and uh, Gold. Gold. Gold, Gold, that's Gold, right, yeah. That's right, yeah. Uh, he was there, I didn't really talk to him. Yeah. But, the thing about Bondi when you talk to him was that he was absolutely steady state and, yeah. and he could explain why that was the way to go mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, as I said it's, it's almost a religious belief mm -hmm. they, they convince themselves and the, the problem is we've got no as humans we have no way of proving reality uh, we can come up with a million theories and they can come up with predictions on what uh, what should happen and you do an experiment you come up with it but the problem is a lot of the experiments come up with the answer you first thought of 
So you don't really get the independent, uh, an independent view of what's going on. I think it's interesting the different the different satellites they've sent up to do the the look at the cosmic microwave. Yeah. Because there's now three generations, and and each time they, you know the new results are released, all the theorists go back and check their theories against what they've discovered, and you know this side declares, oh no, it proves that there is, is inflation. The other side comes out and says, no, it proves that there isn't inflation. Yeah. <laughs> right. They're all looking at the same data. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, that's right. Yeah, so, yeah. Okay. Well, um, do you want to do the honest? Yeah, no, well, I won't. Uh, I haven't got a bottle of wine. Oh, have you? Mm. He doesn't qualify. Oh. <laughs> well, one more question. Uh, Ross, I believe when Einstein died, he uh, had his uh, brain preserved. He did, yes, he was, yes. He was sitting in a jar on the yeah. shelf somewhere. Uh, well, they've actually examined it and did quite a lot. I don't know what they actually proved it was proved with it. Uh, they did yeah. find that it was probably a little bit larger than, than normal, but I don't know if they actually found anything that. It gave him any rate, but it's quite controversial because it was done without his permission, and the guy who took it sort of, uh, I think, got, eventually got sacked for doing it and blah blah blah. And, yeah, it's so quite, quite, um, quite, a, quite a, uh, Jobs next to <coughs> <Carlet's heart. laughs> yeah. yeah, so I don't know where it is today. Actually, no, but, uh, <laughs> and uh, did he actually have any descendants that uh, took an interest in? Uh, Science or theory? Not that I'm aware of, actually. No, that, that doesn't come up in any, anything that I've read. So, um, so he may just be the free family trying to talk. Yeah. Well, that doesn't mean to say that his uh, <laughs> children weren't 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 uh, intelligent, but um, maybe they didn't yeah. have this. The, what makes that next step to go from being intelligent to be able to solve <laughs> solve problems like that? Mm -hmm. yeah. His son, when his sons became an engineer. I think at, at that time there was a theory that I, mean, I guess the biologists were into it that intelligence was related to the number of brain cells, and so they were looking to do a, a check to see if Einstein had this fantastic density of brain cells. I think it was that one. Probably something that he just had another brain like anybody else, um, but he. Well, for whatever reason, was able to put all the <coughs> evidence that he had up there together in unusual ways. Mm. There's an excellent um, series by National Geographic called Genius, which deals with Einstein. That's a interesting insight into there. And Einstein was the, uh, in one of the biographies uh, when Israel was first uh, born. He was offered the first president's position, the position of the president of Israel. Oh, Israel, that's right. And he said, on my condition, that they solve the Palestinian problem, that would be the first <laughs> item. About over a month ago, the ASB, they got a section in the ASB for retirees in the morning. It's a sort of people who don't work, who don't have a job. Um, it comes off, it comes off, I'm going to that audience. And uh, yeah, people like me and, uh, and, and Ross now and then. Um, anyway, uh, he came as one of three and they they divided it up and uh, they did very well. He talked about it. He only had a third of the talk, really, but um, this time he's had the whole lot and uh, he's done a great job. I think he has done a good job. We give him another round of applause. That was a picture of what was taken at the time, on the night, the, uh, on the day, it was the night. Uh, Jim Blanksby got some uh, uh, reproduced pictures, so um, photos of Einstein's head, that's all it was, it was the head. And um, people put them, they used them as masks. People put masks on and they took a photo. So we'll get, I'll send that to Greg so we can publish it in the, moment, in the paper. It's quite an interesting picture of everybody in the room, all Einsteins. Not quite all. They didn't yeah, all put them on. You'll see it.
That was in the crux. Oh, yeah, it's already been in that, and a lot of people here get crux, don't they? Yeah. So it's, it's going to be in crux. It's not in that. It wasn't in that before. But, uh, people, with, people who went, attended the meeting were posted, were sent a copy yet. Yes, anyway. Um, oh, you got to draw the raffle. Yeah, I was going to say, one of the important tasks of the special speaker <laughs> is you got to draw the raffle. <laughs> you can draw up mine if you have to get one. And there's, oh, we're going to have to cry. Uh, C43. Uh, 43. I should mention that the, um, the I don't know if this is a jigsaw, but it's a puzzle, but you need a you need a uh, smartphone mm. for it to work. Anyway, uh, C53. Oh, cry. Uh, <laughs> there's a bloody thing going on. C55. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Leave the bloody drink alone. You shouldn't have any fight. I don't think the committee has a sort of line of fun. Yeah, she's got the public. Please come. 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 Is that the last one? Oh, no, there's another one. C47. You notice they all start with C. C37. Utility tool. A multi tool. Yeah, that's the big side of the big side. Yeah, I'm going to four tickets. I do. I'm going to no, I haven't had time to put this together as a as a um, presentation. So eventually, if we do some I have my reading glasses. The energy loses. The weight increase. Look at the project scrap <coughs>
But I had my reading glasses on in real trouble. Um, I showed some of these at uh, the last public night. I didn't have a chance to really explain what I was talking about, but I thought I would show it tonight. Um, this is a image of the sun at present. This one is the 28th of May. And um, what I wanted to show was that there's no sunspots. And you go on, there's the 29th, there's the 30th, there's the 31st, and on, no sunspots. Oh, that's the same picture. No. <laughs> <laughs> it, looks, it looks like it doesn't. Um, unless NASA is lying, there's the, there's the time and date there. Of the of the image, I, I didn't say something. If you flick back through, there was a light patch that went through there. Oh, the there have been some. <coughs> sun. Yeah, uh, I, I wouldn't say there were sunspots, but there, yeah. there have been. They're right there, see? Are you? Yeah. <coughs> there on the right hand side, oh, back there. Oh, yeah, yeah, there, <laughs> there was. If you looked at the, uh, <coughs> if you looked at the um, <coughs> magnetogram, uh, it did show some disturbances in that area. But it never developed into sunspots as such. And we are actually in the middle of a drought of I've sunspots. A, I've got a question. You know how you were saying before about Mercury being uh, affected by the energy created by the sun as well? The gravity being the mass yeah. plus the uh, energy. Yeah. When the solar event, like with sunspots on one side of the uh, Sun as opposed to the other, the, obviously then the gravity well shifts. <coughs> so does that affect Mercury? The gravity well. Well, if it's putting more energy out to that one side of the sun. No, it's not that doing that. The sun itself has a gravitational field. Mm -hmm. It's potentially you've got a gravitational potential energy in that field, and it drops off as you get further away. Yeah. The energy in that field has a mass. Right. So I... as Mercury and the, and the Earth the same, as the Earth's going around the Sun in its orbit, it's being affected by the mass of the Sun and the mass of that gravitational energy. Right, and I'm saying if there's a, sun, if there's a sunspot event on one side of the Sun, is it creating a gravitational pull that would be a pocket on one side versus the other? Um, because even across the Earth, as we go around, there's different gravitational forces at different spots. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, so I, that I, must affect planets, I, I, maybe I, minutely, but similarly. I, I, I don't, I don't think that... The difference in the energy of a sunspot, the central sunspots may be are actually cooler spots. So the there's the UV... It's such a tiny amount there's of the mass UV, energy yeah. in the sun. It's uh, magnetogram of the sun at the same time. Get a hair, plus or minus a hair on your head. And you can see that there's, <coughs> there's nothing there. To look for a sunspot, what you need to see is a white and a dark. You can see that there's a pair there, white and dark. They're, um, oh, there's another one up there. They are um, two magnetic poles, and they show up. When you get a really good a good sunspot, you'll see them as two separate north-south poles. That's why you get material movement <coughs> between them. We're in sunspot minimum at present. We're just past the minimum, and we're and we're um, uh, expecting that to uh, to come up now. If I'd been really clever, uh, so then, and there it is in UV. Uh, the only reason why we have to have these two lights on. Yeah, I'm just looking at <coughs> the giving a picture. I don't want you to go to sleep, that's why. <laughs> so
So there's the, the same sun <coughs> taken in a different wavelength. This is taken in in the ultraviolet, and you can and the sunspots, uh, uh, the bright the bright ultraviolet spots aren't showing up, and the dark areas that we're seeing here, they generally are where the the sunspots are. So there's nothing there's nothing to see. Now the interesting thing is that the if you see, if you can see up here, there are areas of brightness. See on this rim, where there's more ultraviolet coming off. And the talk that I often give on the effect of sunspots on weather, uh, I'm, I'm, I look at those sorts of things because the the polar circulation cells uh, on the planet, as the Earth's rotating, that we've got a planetary circulation from an equator down towards the pole. It doesn't get to the pole, and around the pole there is a polar circulation cell. The boundary where the uh, warmer air, ultraviolet light is absorbed high in the atmosphere, and it's absorbed by ozone and things like that. So. What you see is that the temperature of the upper atmosphere is slightly higher when there's a lot of UV. And when there's no sunspots around, you get a lot of UV. Um, the upper atmosphere, as it cools, will ultimately start to descend and we'll see that polar circulation cell start to divide off. And uh, see if I can find it. Uh, that, actually, that's quite interesting. That's a, a medallion that was won by Bruce Trigaskis, who was the president of this society. When did Bruce die? <coughs> Ten years ago? Oh, at least that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Bruce was a very active member, uh, both in the ASB and here. He was one of the foundation members. And um, uh, he won a medallion and a commemorative certificate from the French government for the work that he did on um, the International Geophysical Year. And he worked on Aurora, he worked on variable stars. Uh, the medallion was for his work on um, Aurora, I think. see Mars's weather. I don't know if you know it, you can actually look at the uh, the weather on Mars in real time. Um, and this is showing uh, the uh, weather on Sol 89, which uh, I'm not sure what, what date that was. Oh, 26th of February. Well, you can see the air temperature and pressure and the wind directions. Amazing what you can get on the internet these days. Ah, there we go. Um, this is satellite uh, picture taken off our fantastic Weather Bureau. Um, and the Weather Bureau, I remember, is only interested in the air very close to the ground. They're trying to tell you what the weather's going to be, and they'll, they'll uh, uh, make forecasts for aircraft, and the only thing that they can talk about is stuff up to about 10 kilometers. But the really high stuff, which is not weather, you can see the polar circulation. Um, at the equator, you've got, uh, you've got uh, air rising at the equator, running around the, the planet, and eventually falling. Um, where it falls is typically around Sydney, from our, from our, in our uh, part of the world. Um, and then uh, this is all distorted because of the, the uh, way it's set up. 
Um, around the pole, there is a circulation. Two sides to go off of. Time to change the timer. Yeah, I'll have to do that. If I knew how to do it. Um, what you've got is a polar circulation cell that's going around the South Pole, and the um, thing you've got there is that air from the equator is coming and falling down at that point, and it's rising and falling down again from the pole. And so we get these fronts coming up from the polar circulation cell. <coughs> and that determines, in our part of the world, what sort of weather we get. And we're getting, because of the sunspot cycles in minimum, we, that cell's got bigger and we're seeing more cold air coming up from the south. That's what we're getting wet conditions and we're getting all the cold fronts coming up. And I will predict that in about five to 10 years time, if we took these same photographs, you'd find that that polar circulation cell will have shrunk and we would, and those um, France wouldn't be going quite as far north and uh, the way that I've always described it is we get Sydney's weather moves to Melbourne mm -hmm. and Melbourne's weather moves to Sydney. So the, the sunspot cycle actually can affect uh, weather but it's very subtle uh, and you have to be in the right spot. Uh, the reason that we see the effect is because we're in that 30 degrees 30 to 40 degrees south. Now, I also wanted to show you Again, this is not a presentation that's been set up very well, but polar circulation cells are all planets that have got atmospheres have polar circulation cells. Um, and you can see what's going on. Um, the planet is rotating, and as a result, we see the southeastern Euphrates, the golden Euphrates, we see golden Euphrates actually because of the rotation of the planet. And what we see is the air rising at the equator, running along at some high altitude, and then descending again in the mid latitudes. At the same time, it comes down into the low latitudes, and we see air circulating around there. So, um, the type of weather you get depends on where you are on the planet in terms of the whole circulation. And that's a better description of it. Um, and if I, oh, me, if I grab my laser paper, which I hope it's there, I can explain it. So we have the equator. There's the Hadley cell there. And uh, I think this is actually. Here it marked as the mid latitude cell, it's actually called the feral cell, I don't know why it's not that way. And then we get down to the, the polar cell. And you can see what the polar cell is doing. This is air that is rising, this is air that is falling, and this is air that is rising. And we're, what about here somewhere? And so we see this air coming either from the, from the equator 
or from poles. And it's the size of those, the relative size of these poles that determines the type of weather we get during the sunspot cycle. That's a photograph of the Earth's um, polar vortex, and uh, that's a strain there. No, it's not. There's a strain there. And you can see that the polar circulation cell has all these fronts as it goes around. That there is about the Earth polar. And this is a, a, a small movie that shows. The, the polar vortex going around the Antarctica and you can see around here that there are these fronts that are coming up onto Western Australia and it's the size of this vortex that varies with the sunspot cycle. That's another version of it. We got the same thing on, on Venus. There's the polar circulation cell on Venus. Now, in the case of Venus, um, the atmosphere doesn't extend down to the surface. Not, on Earth, it's gas all the way to the surface, and then at that point, it turns into a liquid, uh, and we have an ocean. But on Venus, you, you don't have that. We don't have an ocean. So on Venus, what happens is that as you go deeper and deeper into the atmosphere, the atmosphere gets higher pressure, and, and it eventually gets um, uh, it doesn't change its state. It gets so thick, it's like compressed air, it gets so thick that it stops, stops moving like a gas. And so one of the things about the uh, atmosphere on Venus is that there is a layer of very thick gas that um, is restricting any, any wind because it's too, too thick. And so all these parts here are upper atmosphere winds. I'm not sure if the polar vortex changes. And, and the, the thing about it is that the, the um, material is so compressed that it acts more like a liquid. And they're finding, they're finding uh, uh, waves going through it. So there's the polar vortex on Venus. So we're not that different from the other planets. And uh, that's a uh, series of stills. So in order to, to understand our weather, we also have to understand how planets work. And that's another movie. Um, of course, when you get into the larger planets that are rotating much, much faster, um, uh, the reason you get all these bands is because as the planet increases in size and the rotation rate increases, so you can show that the bands, um, uh, the atmosphere breaks up into these bands purely because it can't sustain the shearing of the rotation of the planet. But you wouldn't say the sunspot activity is going to have an effect on those no, large planets? No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that these plants, these plants have all got more things. When you get to Saturn, it gets complicated. And um, uh, I don't know that they totally understand what, what's going on with Saturn. The thing is that you, you're not dealing so much with uh, the type of weather we have on Earth. What you've got is not far below the cloud um, upper surface, the temperature goes up really fast. Uh, when they said probes into Saturn and into Jupiter, uh, the thing that they confirmed there was that the temperature, obviously the pressure went up, but the temperature went up extremely fast. And so these things, they think, are um, that polar cell breaking up. And we saw, on Earth, we saw lots of fronts, but here they, they've actually turned into storms themselves. This is the vortex. And that's what the vortex looks like for Saturn. Which one is it? Yeah. And 
uh, that's that um, uh, arrangement that we saw before. I'm not sure what, what physics is behind that. Now, the other thing I wanted to show was this ice mountain on Ceres, which I may or may not be able to find. Is it called the ice cream cone? Oh, uh, I don't know. Okay. Okay. Because there's, 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 there's an ice mountain. There's, you've got an ice oh, mountain just in the bottom. It's, it's a beer. It's an iron tip. Have you ever heard the term stuff directory? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I need my reading glasses. That's the problem. I've never heard the term directory. <laughs> um, uh, this is a uh, photograph taken by the spacecraft. That, that was in orbit around Ceres. I can't remember what that was. Not long back. I was only temporarily in orbit. Um, and what I think happened is that the uh, uh, inside Ceres, is obviously water, and they think that as that's come up to the surface as a mud, um, that it's oozed out and uh, formed a, essentially a volcanic cone with an ice slide on the outside. And these streaks, uh, they think it's actually just mud sliding down from that cone. Mm -hmm. So it's another aspect to to the asteroids that we've never mm -hmm. really yeah. seen. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, that's <coughs> only just been released. <coughs> so it's something new. I'll show you about other pictures of it. Right. So I'll call it clips of that, given that I'm having trouble reading the screen. I will we'll stop for coffee. Thank you.